This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated uh, from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. It has a throttle. We'll talk about it on air, online, on mobile, or on your smart speaker. This is our auto expert, and I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with our truck girl, Jen. You're a little grumpy this morning. Just a little. Were you? Yes. And then we rode in in your truck. Yes. Which you always talk about, your trucks. You have two. Mm -hmm. Both Chevys. Yep. Both big gas engines my, yes my 2500 and uh, you like you like don't judge me what do you, what don't you like what's wrong you pointed at the board what's wrong echoey oh how about now is perfect that, okay oh no, that's worse no that's echoey <laughs> we were fine the first time i think the echo's in your head no <laughs> why are i allowed to judge your truck no i said don't judge that it's not in perfect condition in the inside no. i've been busy this week it's not perfectly clean does it any different any other time? Yes. Is it? Yes. Because it had teddy bears and stuff in the back. Yeah. Well, that's been in there oh, for a long time. Oh. <laughs> I'm suspicious <laughs> that your truck hasn't changed much. I mean, you're very industrious. You have like a garbage sack up front. And that's the law in Washington. What? You have to have a garbage sack in your vehicle? Yes, because if you don't, it's um, intent to litter. That's a second degree offense right, if you get right. pulled over. This is like a whole show right here. I know. Well, welcome. Well, that's in Washington. Anyways. So wait, if you get pulled over by the cops in Washington State. Correct. And you don't have a trash bag in your car. Correct. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I can't believe it. Look it up. They no. Just, okay. Well, they just. Look, show me. I'll look it up for you. I think then. it's a lie. It's I think somebody's not. like fooled you. You've nope. got, it's an internet scam. No, nope, it's not. If you get pulled over in your vehicle and you don't have a trash bag in it, you it's get a, a ticket. It's a secondary offense. Yes, right. they can give if you If you're a, a law ticket. enforcement in Washington State, call me right now because I think it's a lie. I think it's shenanigans. I think it's the plastic bag industry, the trash can industry trying to make more money out of us. Well, now you're going to make me look it up. Okay. Jen won't be here for the rest of the show because she's trying to find out how she got internet scammed. What is on today's show? Absolutely packed. Uh, we're going to be talking about the event that uh, we just did called Run to the Sun, which is where um, 24 journalists get into 24 cars and they drive them over to about 20, sometimes like 10, but usually around 20, 25 miles each time, and then you swap. And uh, we get to choose the best convertible, the best coupe, the best performance car, the best sun, the best performance SUV, the overall winner. Do you find it yet? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-mm. -mm. No, you didn't. And uh, uh, we're, oh. we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about some of the cars that were in that event. We'll talk to Justin from Mazda about the MX-5 Miata, the brand new one, by the way. They just uh, rejiggered the engine. They uh, gave it a few extra horsepower. They put a new transmission in it. You'd think the Miata couldn't get much better, the MX-5. We had the RF, which is the hardtop convertible. That was so much fun to drive. Um, also, we had a Rolls-Royce there, a $428,000 black badge Rolls-Royce Wraith. Uh, we're going to also talk to Brian Armistead today. Uh, he's our friend from the uh, from the Baltimore area, and Brian is a great car reviewer, a, an absolute en enormously tall African American gentleman who is one of my best friends in the world. And he's been driving the Range Rover Evoque. If you ever, if you are wondering about the Range Rover Evoque, uh, he he will fill you in. By the way, I've been driving one this week as well, so I'll be able to point counterpoint him. It'll be like a big political thing. It's uh, September is Accident Awareness Month, so we'll have an opportunity to talk to uh, David Pierceman. He's the founder and lead attorney uh, who will be able to tell us an awful lot about how you d deal with insurance during accidents. One of those things that you really want to know. And uh, the interesting thing about that is um, Volvo have a new, uh, a new app, which is called Care by Volvo. And when you get into an accident and it's the car senses you've been in an accident, it automatically texts you what to do. I mean, after the accident is over, like who to call, what state you're in, what, what stuff to fill out. Well, I'll talk a little bit about that. And Anton Wallman's going to join us. He is our independent analyst and investor. Anton is going to talk about the new Porsche Taycan. 
And we can't get through this show without uh, mentioning the new Land Rover Defender, which was announced uh, this week, which was pretty amazing um, in Frankfurt. Um, We've been waiting for this vehicle. I drove a prototype in 2012 around a dock in New York City, and we've been waiting for a super long time for this vehicle to arrive. Did you see what they came out with? What? The Lego version. Oh, yeah. It's so cute. So I want the real version. <laughs> what about you? So I found out the the law. Okay, go. Okay, apparently it was a $95 fine for not having a litter bag in your car or boat, but apparently it was repealed in July 2003. All right. So apparently I've been driving for a long time. because 16, I don't 16 have years. With garbage bag. 16 years with a gar- <laughs> unnecessary garbage bag in hey, your car. you need a bag in your car. You never know what you're going to use it for. I mean, I understand that point, but I wouldn't be putting a garbage bag in my car because it was the law. Well, I always follow the rules. I know, but <laughs> it's like saying you have to drive with one you know, eyebrow shorter than the other. It seems like fairly ridiculous. Well, now you can't. I mean, don't litter. Well, now you can't drink you, coffee or anything. That's a, a law. I have to pay attention. You know, in the UK, mm-hmm. I guess this already, but where I come from, mm. in the UK... <laughs> You're not allowed, if you drive a commercial vehicle like a truck or a van, you're not allowed to have food or drink in the front compartment. Yeah. You can't do that now in Washington in a regular vehicle. You can have it in there, but you can't be eating. Yeah, well, you have to have your hands on the wheels. Yeah. Uh, I think it's when you see people driving down the freeway eating their to-go food, it's kind of scary sometimes. I still see people on the phone. And Oh, yeah. It drives me crazy. And putting their makeup on. Oh, I haven't seen is that. Is this pet peeve show? Do we decide this was the okay, pet peeve how, show? Okay, how about shaving? I've seen that a few times. Yeah. Guys are just shaving. Yeah, but I guess at a light that makes sense. I mean, if you're in that much of a rush in the morning, electric shaver. I mean, I hope it wasn't like an open no, blade and, driving. and a sink and foam and stuff. That no. should be illegal. Why? Then I should... Why Ill- driving? Oh, wait. I, I'm driving, I While guess. you're driving, yes. Uh, at a light? I get it. Should should ladies be allowed to put their makeup on at a light? Why not? You're at a stop sign or stoplight. You're not going anywhere. Yeah, but you see what often happens is the light changes and everyone pulls away and they're still putting eyebrow pencil on. Well, I don't know. Why? I don't need eyebrow pencil. All right. All right. Could have been <laughs> lipstick. Eyebrow pencil was just an example. You should oh, be. You are making you should, me work so hard you today. You should be dressed and ready to go when you go out that door. Oh, shoot. That is. That's I'm going to call be. your son, Stephen, and ask him if you're a real growly bear mother. I am not. I'm a nice mom. <laughs> I don't know, because well, I'm getting like, you should be dressed and ready to go when you get in the car and drive to work in yes. the morning. Right. Be prepared, always. Stand by, more show coming up. We're going to talk to Justin from Mazda about the uh, Run for the Sun event and the new MX-5. That's all coming up as our auto expert continues. You're listening to our auto expert. All right, well, you can check out uh, all of our Auto Expert to catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, our automotive videos are there, read inside car stories, and, of course, check out your next ride all at ourautoexpert.com. Spent uh, several days up in Skamania Lodge, which is in Stevenson, Washington. Very beautiful, very rural, very beautiful with uh, the Mazda Miata MX-5, and uh, joining us on the phone is Justin uh, to talk about this vehicle uh, representing Mazda. The million-selling Mazda Miata gets a powerful boost. The most powerful MX-5 returns with its lightweight routes and fun to drive. So, uh, Justin, increased the horsepower by about 26, a little more powerful for 2019. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's about a 17% increase. Um, it's one of the most amazing things that our engineers have done because it's the exact same engine. So if you're familiar with the current generation uh, of Mazda MX-5, it's the same stack as 2.0 beta engine. And all we did was kind of fine-tune different components of the engine, um, adjust the exhaust, uh, and basically speed up more so that it could provide more and you know give more smiles to fans as they drive. All these vehicles, but um, hey Nick, it's great for having me here. Um, just wanted to touch back on Run to the Sun. It's just an amazing event. Like we love the journalists out there; they're very talented. Um, the roads are amazing. The weather was actually perfect. You planned a really good time for it. <laughs> it was perfect. To, it was great to bring the Miata there, like the iconic roadster. Uh, I mean, we hit the nail on the head. We 
sold over a million. It's actually the Guinness World Record for uh, the best selling roads in the world. So we hold this vehicle very, very close to our hearts, um, and we're glad that we were able to bring it out. Yeah, it, what's the secret to Mazda's success? Because the Miata is, I mean, we had a great event driving around to the sun. But why do you think the Miata is so popular? Uh, it just seems like it was the go-to car. Right? We, we had the AVA, the Automotive Video Association, uh, who get to choose the performance car and SUV of the year. And we had it up there for that event. And uh, there, there's some really hardcore fans, and they love that vehicle. So what do you think the secret to the success of the Miata or the MX-5 is? Uh, I mean, I can't give away all the secrets, but if I have to say something, for sure it's the the passion behind all the people at Mazda, from the designers, the engineers, to all the employees. Like, I, out of all, I'm, for, in my opinion, like, there's a passion that goes into every person's work, and it really shows in the vehicle. So um, one of the examples with all Mazda vehicles, not just the Miata, is when we design them, we actually use a big block of clay and, and shave it down to really have the design. So... The designer uses their actual hands to, like, feel the body lines, to understand the way it's going to look, the way it's going to reflect on the light. It's just that extra thinking before it goes into the machine and the mass production. There's a lot of passion built in from the leather that's hand-stitched. Um, all that stuff is attention to details that, you know, people might not notice, but in the long run, it, it develops a big following in a sense. Um, also, the Miata has been around for 30 years. We're actually celebrating 30 years this year. So we've collected a lot, a lot, a lot of fans over the years. Um, and it's been great. Um, when we first announced it in Chicago Auto Show in 1989, there was a red, line blue, first-generation Miata. Um, if you were at the Auto Show this year, just other things, we had not the exact same ones, but, well, one of them was the exact same ones, but we had a red, white, and blue of the different generations as we're in the fourth So we had a first generation, second generation, third generation, all red, white, and blue. Kind of pay homage to the original debut. We also debuted um, the 30th anniversary, yeah, which is a racing orange. Um, it's great. It's, and it has a lot. It, it, you know, it's, it, that's one of the things that, that's interesting. So we had these 24 journalists who got to drive this vehicle over two days, and you got to sit in the uh, passenger seat for that experience. It, the car makes you want to drive fast. It makes you want to, you know, have a fun time with the, with the hard top down. Um, did you, in that driving experience, did you have some scary moments with some people in there that you just think, all right, calm down, Sally Ann. You need to, you know, take your foot oh. off the accelerator. Do you go crazy, Jen? No, I drove responsibly. Oh, good. Yeah, but I had a blast. <laughs> I had a blast in it, though. It just it just and makes you want to go. Did, did Justin? Did you have any times in that car where you were just like people just couldn't resist it? Um, well, there were times that people couldn't resist it, but I totally felt safe every step of the way. Um, that's what's great about this car: the perfect balance, the handling. It's it's definitely one of those. Um, you can drive this. You know, you can drive it slow and it'll still feel very fast and exhilarating, um, which keeps everything safe. There's just a lot of, um, a lot that goes into it that, you know, it keeps it nice and nimble. You can turn it whichever way and it'll still, you'll still feel safe and grounded. Plus, you know, the WAPO members are very talented. They're very, you know, I respect them very much. And likewise, they respect the Miata. They know how to drive it. They know how it's limits in a sense. Um, and it's, you know, it's, with 181 horsepower, you could do a lot, but not go crazy, and you can live, you can feel all of 180 horsepower in a sense, um, and still feel safe. So originally, it debuted uh, with a smaller engine. The first generations of the Mazda Miata uh, debuted with, I think, a 1.6 liter engine. You managed to get a two liter engine into that space. How? How do you think you could get a bigger engine into that space? Because I love 181 horsepower, but now I'm keep thinking to myself. Huh, I wonder if I could get a 2.5 liter engine in there. Car's <laughs> so kidding. light, though, Nick. <laughs> I know. Well, you know me. You don't want to take it of, airborne. Uh, well, maybe I do. <laughs> maybe I do, Jennifer. Maybe I do. Uh, it, it seems we'll like... we have to put wings on it then for you, Nick. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Dukes of Hazard style oh, over God. some railway tracks <laughs> in, in Skamani, Washington. Uh, it, it seems like this vehicle just has an en endless op opportunities. You put the RF, which is basically the hard top, 
uh, on it as well, which makes it great for people who live above the Mason-Dixon line where they have bad weather <laughs> and snow. It's a rear-wheel drive, so it's extremely enjoyable. There seems to be opportunities just to keep doing things with this vehicle. I mean, looking from the very first generation, which is a very basic inside uh, of the vehicle, uh, you've now has a screen, it has Bose headphone, head, sorry, Bose speakers in the headrests. I mean, the, it just seems to keep going and going with new and more opportunities to grow the brand and grow the car. Oh, definitely. Um, we're always moving forward. We're always looking up to see how we can offer more premium features for our fans. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, that's an engineer question as far as the bigger engine, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen our engineers do some crazy stuff. Uh, and it's always come out amazing, and it's always stayed true to the brand, which is a vehicle that has a great driving dynamic while also delivering um, premium features for people of today, in a sense. It's always an updated version. It has all the basic features. It has all the premium features that you want, um, but as long as you maintain that lightweight, fun to drive, great thing that the Miata is known for, and frankly, all Mazdas are known for, um, then, you know, sky's the limit. Hey, Justin, remember when we were driving and I asked you about the speaker system? And do you remember the story you told me? Ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, this is a was, really interesting it's, it's story. It's interesting story. Uh, so Bose, they're, they're amazing. They work with us very closely. This is both Bose US working with Mazda US as well as um, Bose Japan and, and Mazda Japan working together. Um, and everybody's on the common goal of making the ideal sound for the people inside, from the driver to the passengers. Um, and, you know, everybody's looking at the, the common thread is sound, but obviously they have to communicate with each other. So um, there's always a language barrier. Like, how can an American easily say, oh, there's like a lot of crackle, there's a lot of uh, booming, there's a lot of hiss, you know, like kind of sounds that we make that a Japanese engineer might not understand. And so, and vice versa. So there's first, there's a language where you kind of have to make a, a um, like a legend of sorts to understand each other. And then from there, then you start tuning things and working on it. Um, and then obviously, I would say in the U.S., we're very into like pop and hip hop, like at least nowadays, like that kind of music. Uh, while, you know, in other parts of the country, they could be more into classical. It's just a different kind of sound. So the, the base to tune, in a sense, would usually be about, you know, with classical music, like things like that kind of, tone um so that's the base but then once we brought the japanese engineers close to mazda and both to the u.s and kind of like okay now we need to pump it up a bit to fit for the pop and um, music so i think i i have to go back and check this one reason, but i think there was an uh, instance where the japanese engineers were inside of mazda on their laptop listening justin to- hang on a second i want to pick this up the other side of the commercial break but hang on one second you're listening to the our auto expert podcast Justin from Mazda is on the phone. We were talking about uh, the the way the engineers communicate in different languages with the uh, with the Bose systems to explain it. So sorry, Justin, we had to take a break for that pesky news at the bottom of the hour. Pick up the story. Explain to us uh, again where we were. So obviously they had a hard time communicating how crackles and pops happen when you have an, a language barrier. Yeah, uh, definitely. It was definitely an interesting way for them to work collaboratively together. Um, but they made it happen, and as soon as, you know, the tuning was, was being done, um, then obviously you have to adjust it for all different types of music, especially in the U.S. where we're into, you know, pop, hip-hop, some of those bigger bass-hitting uh, music. So uh, I have to double-check the, the what song it was specifically with the engineer uh, that I heard the story from. But if I remember correctly, we had a bunch of Japanese engineers inside a Mazda. Doors are closed, you know, in the tunnel, so they can hear exactly what's going on their laptop, very focused. And I believe it was Little John turned down for what? Just blasted up to 11. It was a hilarious moment. It, it sounds like that there is fun. I was, uh, interestingly enough, when I've, uh, I'll be going to Tokyo Auto Show this year, but when I go to these auto shows uh, and we have to get translations between engineers and journalists, what ends up happening is that uh, they have special translators who are also engineers to try and explain things because obviously words don't translate well. 
So uh, it's, it's kind of a creative way around around the uh, the situation. Now, I also wanted to tell you, uh, Justin, congratulations, because uh, the Northwest Automotive Press Association named the Mazda Miata MX-5 for 2019 uh, the best convertible. Uh, the best, the most fun in the sun with the top down, and uh, that that was a pretty uh, good category to win, because uh, you were up against things like the Jeep Wrangler and the um, the Fiat 124. So it's uh, I think people really enjoyed it, and the best part of it for me is the fact that uh, it, it has the hard top convertible. And of course, you know, having a soft top, and people will call me uh, weak, but if you drive around in the weather where it snows and rains and is cold, uh, having a soft top isn't always the best way to get around. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been, it's two years in a row now, so, you know, we love this Miata so much and we're glad that you all love it as well. Um, definitely, you know, Portland and Washington, that area has some of the greatest roads to really exhibit a lot of its potential. Um, and it, it's just definitely been a, a great event, and we're honored to to win the award again. Um, yeah, and the competition, it was de- definitely some some unique options there, and uh, you know, it really showed the journalists the different ways you can enjoy the sun in a sense. Uh, and we're just glad we were able to take that home again. Um, as far as sorry, what was the, the other thing you mentioned? No, I think I think that was it. I mean, it's it's nice to have that convertible, the hard top convertible, because oh, of the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, you know. We we want Miata has been known as a soft top for years and years and years. Um, and while a lot of people love the Miata, not everybody uh, you know is in, enthralled with a soft top in a sense. So we wanted to make sure we had another option that kind of still had the same convertible feel, the same Miata ness in a sense, um, but to cater to a wider range of fans in a sense. Uh, and that way everybody can enjoy them you know, there's one out for everybody basically right and I, and I think that's the nicest thing too although i do really like that brown uh option for the soft top that you have in 2019 that was that's really cool um i'm very weak i get very weak over uh, nice color combinations of vehicles and uh <laughs> and we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, be amiss if we or we would be amiss if we didn't mention the fact uh, that they the red the crystal red paint that you have the metallic crystal red paint that you have on that vehicle is something that was specially developed by mazda having to actually invent a new spraying head so all the pieces of metal laid in the same direction uh, yeah, uh, basically our solid crystal is one of our trademark colors. Um, it's a three layer paint process. It's like a black, a red, and a clear, I believe. Um, originally it was meant for only our concept vehicles, but everybody loved it so much that we were like, we have to find a way to mass produce it. Um, obviously a concept vehicle, you're spraying it by hand. It's a one time thing only. It's very unique. Um, so it's hard to basically mimic that in a machine where a machine is very, very serialized. It does the one thing and it's programmed that way. So we have to actually program little imperfection in the machine to spray as if it was spraying by hand and basically give it that um, that vibrantness, that luster. Um, and as well as because of those imperfections, the way the light reflects on it, you get different feelings basically uh, depending on how the lighting is, how it's go- when it's going through a shadow, going through you know bright sun. Um, and it really gives off a, a strong emotion with the vehicle. Uh, and it plays well with the body lines as well, or the lack of body lines. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of cases where it's just nice, big body panels, and you could really see the flow of the vehicle. It, it really helps give it that, you know, that essence of, of going fast without necessarily going fast. It's really good, Justin. Thanks for joining us, and congratulations on your win for the uh, the most fun in the sun vehicle. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about another vehicle that was at the event, and this vehicle, I can tell you, is two hundred and forty-eight thousand versus the vehicle that we drove, the Mazda Miata, which was a lot less. You're listening to our Auto Expert. People often accuse me of, uh, you know, being a little biased, coming from the UK. Yeah. Do you think I'm biased towards UK vehicles? Mm. I like me some Mini, I like me some Land Rover, I like me some Jaguar, I like me some Aston Martin, and especially like me some Rolls Royce. Oh, who doesn't love a beautiful Rolls Royce? Well, <laughs> the world's premier automotive uh, luxury vehicle, the most premier luxury brand in the world rolls royce and uh, jerry joining us from rolls royce you uh you sent us 
a absolutely outstanding, beautiful Rolls Royce to uh, this year's Run to the Sun, Jerry, worth four hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. We're just talking about the Mazda Miata uh, RF convertible. You could buy sixteen of those, but I'd much rather, I think, have the black badge Rolls Royce Wraith in my driveway. Uh, this is everything Rolls Royce do amazingly well. Yes, Nick, and I, I'm glad you everyone had a chance to enjoy it. Uh, run to the sun, and it was our pleasure to participate this year. Um, I would venture to guess we don't have a lot of our clients or of the Mazda clients cross-shopping those two vehicles. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that, uh, you know, one one of them has sold a million and the other one is is worth a million. It's just incredible. <laughs> to uh, The one thing that was, you know, on everybody's list at this year's Run to the Sun, all 24 journalists, were it was almost a running start when, the, uh, when the, they came up to drive the Rolls-Royce at their turn. Everybody was like, here we go. We've been waiting for this all day. <laughs> it, it was, was exciting. Uh, it was definitely amazing. Uh, it's, it's not, it, is, it is an event. It's it, an event unto itself. It, absolutely. And it's not just about the fine handmade tailoring, but it's all the, also the performance. I mean, when you get something in a V12 engine, Jerry, you can't but have an amazing time. You know, absolutely, Nick. And the, one of the things that people forget about is that a Rolls Royce is not really a car you know people don't buy a car when you commission a rolls royce and we've had this conversation a few times is it is everything but let not forget that that v you know the the six 6.5 liter v12 engine the transmission the way that it's put together the engineering that goes into it uh it is second to none and one of the reasons we were thrilled to send and share with you black badge this year is Nothing shows you the engineering capability and the image capability of Rolls Royce like a black badge, and nothing drives like a black badge rate. Uh, and that, that, so let's talk a little bit about black badge and and what it means and and how, where it came from because you know you noticed a trend at Rolls Royce with people who were buying your vehicles but they weren't just driving them out of the showroom they were driving them to a shop and doing things to them before they garage them in their in their home right. Exactly, yeah. And we saw a lot of cars where our clients wanted them blacked out. And, you know, it started with the cars being black, blacked out. So they would order a black car, they'd take it into an aftermarket place, paint all the chrome, paint the, God help us, paint the spirit of ecstasy, um, and you know, which is fine. That's, if that's what they want, we realized that we needed to meet that demand. Uh, but when we looked at it, we said, we don't want to just do it on a cosmetic level. That's not the way Charles Rolls or Henry Royce would have done it. We want to do it really organically. So Black Badge to us is, is two sides of the car. One of it is the cosmetic side, that darker, edgier image. And as you saw in Pebble Beach this year, Black Badge doesn't have to be black. We have the blacked out, uh, the darkened chrome, the darkened spirit of ecstasy. Now, in Rolls Royce fashion, we don't paint it. We don't just take that and paint it. That, that's not going to be that enduring quality. We actually go through a chemical deprivation process where, for lack of a better word, we smoke the chrome and we turn it dark in an autoclave. Um, we do that with all the chrome. We put on uh, the, the, the highest tech carbon fiber wheels that are in the industry. I always love to say we can save you a few pounds on your, your almost three-ton uh, Rolls Royce. Um, and it's given a very dark, edgier look. And that's what our clients were looking for. I know. But Yep. After you drove it, right? Right. I mean, I also the thing that I love about Black Badge is you know, I spend most of my time on the inside of a vehicle anyway. So although it looks stunning when you walk up to it and you see it, but you you, you take the insides and you give it a flare and, and, and you give it sort stars. of... Yeah, it I mean, oh, stars. Yeah. It had stars in the ceiling. The he Jen is... <laughs> starlight she, headliner. Yeah. yeah. It's she, beautiful. And I also explained to her that air, the starlight headliner is actually proper constellations. So every single yep. one is put together Absolutely. with the star in the right place. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Tan done. And on the inside of a black badge, there's two things that make it very unique. One is... We have a technical fiber, a technical carbon fiber using aluminum thread that we reserve only for black badge commissions. And that's something that for that edgier, darker client, they want something that's edgier and cool on the inside of, a, of the Rolls Royce. But you're right. You know, the, all of the, the black badge, what we do is we encourage the client to go with 
really aggressive poppy colors. I, I literally just got out of one like 10 minutes ago of a black badge wraith, iced Salamanca blue exterior oh. on the interior, black and Salamanca blue oh. highlights throughout the car. Oh. And if, for those of you on, yeah, I know we're on radio, Salamanca blue is like a bright, rich, bright blue. Yeah. So you get this pop back and forth. Um, but we have this, the signature Starlight Headliner, which is ubiquitous pretty much on every single Black Badge rate and every single Black Badge Ghost we make. It's so amazing. It's, 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 a, it's, the, it's a, yeah, it's an artistic creation. The sound system was incredible as well. <laughs> okay, what station were you listening to? <laughs> Not telling. <laughs> but the subwoofer was in use. <laughs> okay. Well, and that's the thing. You know, we have the bespoke audio. You've got uh, 16 speaker speakers in the Wraith, um, two subwoofers. It's, you know, what we do is we design everything for that specific car. But, you know, we, you know as I said earlier, it's not just about the design. You know, we can take that design as far and as edgy or as smooth as you want to take it. We also made a lot of engineering enhancements to the Black Badge. And what sort of what extra things do, does somebody get apart from the colors in, in the black badge to get? I mean, with the Spirit of Ecstasy is blacked out, obviously. Uh, the interior has much brighter colors and the carbon fiber. But is it is it a design element that the black badge offers, or is it a, a step more than that? Well, it's the combination. And what I would say is when you look at a lot of uh, like car brands out there that have a performance brand, they tend to go... It looks like, you know, Car X, but we have all this performance underneath. Or you'll find companies that will do brands that will do, oh, this car looks really cool with just a few tweaks. And what we've done is we've walked that line. We have half of it, and the most obvious, are all of these, this, this image, this design, this edgier feel, this edgier look. But it's at least the other half of it is the engineering enhancements. And it all starts with the power of a Rolls Royce. You know, you know, every Rolls Royce is extremely powerful. You know, we have um, very, very uh, powerful V12 engine. Typically, we tune that so that it's a very smooth ride. You know, you can even in a Wraith, a standard Wraith, 4.4 seconds zero to 60. It's 4.4 seconds zero to 60 in a very refined manner. Um, with a black badge, we've tuned the engine so that you have faster and higher transmission shifts. So you, you, we pulled the 0 to 60 down to 4.1 seconds. And you're going to feel a little bit more of it. And the, the, you know, our clients want that. They want to feel a little bit sportier. We've tightened the steering, tightened the suspension. We've uh, increased the um, torque on the Wraith up to 640 uh, pound-feet of torque, feet pound of torque. And we've, um, on the Ghost and Dawn, we've increased as well. We've also increased the horsepower. So you have a more powerful, uh, faster, uh, let's just say it's a bit more dynamic car to drive. Um, and, of course, we put bigger brakes on. So, and because um, if you go fast, you have to stop fast, right? Yeah. You have to stop, you have to stop fast, but you have to stop well. And you know, this is, um, with a magic honestly, carpet ride, you can't have a – you know, magic carpets don't come to a screeching halt. Neither should a Rolls Royce. Okay, no, so they, they, they smoothly glide to a safe stop. Okay, so for people who've never been in a Rolls Royce, let's tell them the cool stuff that's in the inside, <laughs> like the doors and the umbrellas. So coach doors, kind of Jerry. Every Rolls Royce has coach doors, two, at least two. All the coupes have coach doors. Those are the doors that open reverse. Yeah, um, just Jerry, opposed, Jerry, yeah. Jerry, block your ears for a second. Block your ears for a second. No, don't for say that S word. <laughs> for people who don't know and people who yeah. are uninformed, they call those suicide doors. Right. Correct. <laughs> but yeah, they're actually they're similar, coach doors. They're, they're, they open the same way a suicide door opens. Let me put it that way. A suicide door opens to 90 degrees. Ours don't right. open full 90 degrees. But, yes, they're the doors that open to the reverse, similar to a suicide door. Coach doors, they're big. They give it, make it really easy to get inside, particularly into the coupes, the Dawn and the, and the Wraith. Um, when you open the door, in every Rolls Royce, either in the door or in the, uh, the front quarter panel sleeve, there's a, there's a Rolls Royce umbrella, a bespoke umbrella. And that's twofold. So one of them is obvious, which is to protect you from the rain when you get out. And, of course, when you put the umbrella back in the sleeve, it's Teflon coated and you have a, um, a passageway from the engine compartment that dries it out. Now, Nick, can you tell us the secondary use of the Rolls Royce umbrella? No pressure. Um, it, it's used to defend yourself against blackguards and <laughs> rapscallions. 
that as well. Or if you have a young lady dri- riding with you and she's oh, yes. exiting the car, you can ensure that you would not have any paparazzi lady moments. You're right. Um, it's a very it's a it's a chauffeur's tool. Excellent. Um, and that's one of the things. So it's, you have the umbrella, you have the coach doors. Um, I think you should. You know, it. I think we've discovered something here. I think you should have a sword in the middle of the umbrella. <laughs> like a James Bond well, we, type yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, great. We offer unlimited bespoke options. Uh, we, we're going to have to get you in with our bespoke designers in, in Goodwood, home of Rose Hurts. I'm wondering, I'm going to see if I can get a sword umbrella and then send it to them, and they could probably make it an offering of having one. Unfortunately, in the UK, you're not allowed to have anything over a three inch blade in your vehicle, but <laughs> it's not technically in your vehicle, is it? Oh as, as we say, um, we will bespoke anything into a Rolls Royce that is legally possible. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave. Oh. We'll end this discussion. <laughs> okay, so back to the the car. So the lambs will. Oh, so floor. carpet lambs yeah. will carpet right. Uh, made to yeah, drive with I, your I, shoes off. I always encourage everyone to take their shoes off the moment they get in the car and enjoy the lamps. Well, four inch lamps wool carpets. The um, one of the things I love about Rolls Royce is the, the huge potential to bespoke the the leather combinations. And, you know, for your listeners, go in when you're, if you're going to buy a car, go in and say, oh, I want to change the colors on the interior and just see the reaction. When you're bespoke in a Rolls Royce, you can not only change the color combinations on the interior, you can change where, where you put them. You can have four or five different colors on the seat. And I've seen some really, really creative um, artwork done with the leather. And, of course, our leather is all... Um, the highest grade leather. It comes only from bulls. Uh, bulls don't have stretch marks, except for the fat bulls, which we don't. We don't. <laughs> they, come, they come from altitude. They're all raised at altitude in Europe, uh, above the line where there's mosquitoes, and they cannot be raised on uh, branches where there's barbed wire. Wow. We do everything we can to have the perfect, the perfect, and we inspect them when they come in. Uh. The typical Rolls Royce will use between six and eleven bull hides. You know, with a Phantom Museum, I think it's eleven or twelve now in the new one. Um, Jerry, I think I'm going to have to. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have to sit down. You're making me dizzy with all this stuff. Uh, we're running. We're, yeah. we're we're fastly running out of time. We're going to crash into the news. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you that every opportunity, I'm trying to invent opportunities in my head. I will. Uh, I will drive a Rolls Royce. It's and amazing. The best luxury vehicle in the world, Jerry from Rolls Royce. Thank you so much for joining thanks, us. Thanks, guys. And uh, we will, of course, post uh, pictures of the Rolls Royce uh, online at OurAutoExpert.com Coming right back with more on this week's show. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast, this is America's Car Radio Show. It has a throttle, we'll talk about it on air online, on mobile, or your smart speaker, Our Auto Expert and OurAutoExpert.com. Uh, John Vincent joining us in the studio. Uh, Megan's here. Uh, John, um, most Americans don't know anything about tires. They go in and they expect the guy at the tire store just to tell them. That is true, and that's why they make a lot of mistakes when they buy tires. But uh, I've, that's what I've been doing the whole time. <laughs> I just made a mistake. Ah, great. Uh, so, all right. So, Armas, as a consumer... Tell us what we need to do. Do we just have to learn about tires? Is there a, uh, or what? Well, fortunately, there are a lot of great resources out there to learn about tires, um, like TireRack.com and other online uh, resources. They can tell you um, what tires fit your car, what experiences other buyers have had with those tires on your specific vehicle. There's just a wealth of information out there. Well, let's start at the very beginning, as uh, Julie Andrews would say. Uh, what, why do I care about tires? We ask tires to do a lot for us. They're not just the things that the car rolls on. We rely on them for traction. We rely on them for braking. We rely on them for steering. We also rely on them to get us the best gas mileage we possibly can. All right. So now tires have an important role in the the transportation of my family. Yes, Megan. How do tires help with gas mileage? Depending on the resistance and the tread pattern, they can either hurt your mileage or help your mileage. Oh, my gosh. That's (laughs) life-changing. You know, well, I bet you if I went down and looked at your minivan, the, the tires would be bald. We're not going to discuss that. <laughs> I'm just saying. That minivan doesn't deserve new tires. <laughs> yes, you might. 
you might deserve to be able to stop when you come to a light the next time. Good point. Um, I I learned recently from a friend of mine at Pirelli that uh, winter tires and snow tires are two completely different things. This is true. And most people think that winter tires are fine. Most people refer to snow tire winter tires as snow tires, and the correct term is winter tires because they work more in more than just snow. Right, and and all seasons are not either winter tires. All seasons are basically all but was one season tires. They're right. a compromise. Why aren't they called season. three season tires? Because that won't do well for marketing. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I've never because, even heard of winter tires. What? Yo, you come from Texas. I mean, I honestly, honestly. Uh, I'm not surprised. You come okay. from Texas. In Texas, you have one kind of tire on your car. I've heard of snow tires. Right. Well, but they're winter tires. They're really winter tires. Hmm. See? See? Um, I also learned that if it drops below 44 degrees, that all seasons don't work. No, uh, they really don't. Um, it, below 44 degrees, all seasons become too hard to travel on and become dangerous. Not necessarily dangerous, but they don't give you the maximum traction you can have. All right, so stopping might be an issue if you don't have winter tires. Well, and going might be an issue. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> going, you can always just put more gas in. Stopping, the wall comes up pretty quick, or the back of the car in front comes up pretty quick. All right. They say that having traction in the winter just gets you to the scene of the accident faster. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> Megan's, like, now horrified. Wow. She's going to check all her tires at home. Uh, get, arm us with some stuff that we need to do and do take care of our tires with. Well, the first thing you want to do when you're shopping for tires, don't look at the tires that are on your car. Look at the little placard next to the, um, behind the driver's side door that tells you the tires that the car originally came on. Because you don't know whether some owner or somewhere along the way maybe switched the tires off to a different size, a different brand, that might not be appropriate for the car. Or some unscrupulous uh, tire salesman switched your tires out. That's possible. That I've heard that could happen. <laughs> I've heard that could happen. Look at him being all PC. Uh, all right. So we, we look at the plate inside the car. What else should we remember? You want to think back about when your tires were good and think about what you liked about those tires and what you didn't like about those tires. Were they really loud rolling down the road? Well, you can find a quieter option. Did they not give you good wet traction? You might want to look for something, you know, with a little bit better wet traction. Megan, do you remember when your minivan was new? Uh, barely. Was it better? No. <laughs> it couldn't have been worse, honestly. It was about the same, to be honest. Really? I think I bought a lemon. But but I didn't realize that the tires would make for a quieter ride. Is your minivan noisy? Uh, no, not really. All right, so you're happy with the noise. Is what I, John's I don't saying. know. I mean, I listen to the music super loud, so. All right. Is that how you avoid listening to rattles and squeaks and stuff? <laughs> yeah. You just turn the stereo up higher? Yes, that's why my car is sold. Okay. <laughs> um, when you go into a tire shop, you should be armed with what you want. You should be armed with what you want, and you should know about how much you should pay. All right. Never walk into a tire shop without doing some research ahead of time, comparison shopping around the around the Internet to know what the tires cost. Now, wait a minute. Don't you just go, like, we all go to the big box stores, and they've got this, the tire center in there. Like, no. isn't that the best deal? Not always. Okay. Um, for one thing, they carry a very limited selection. And if you okay. want something outside of their selection... They can be just as expensive as anywhere else. Well, that is good to know. So you know what you want. You go in there. You know the price you want to pay. How do you take, make the tire guy not sell you something you don't want? You hold your ground and ask for what you want and know what bring you a, want. Bring a flamethrower. <laughs> bring Megan with you. Give him a little wink. <laughs> yeah, that's going to work for me. Hey. Winking at the guys in the tire store is <laughs> clearly going to get me a better deal, Megan. I'd pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> John's like, I'm not getting sucked into this one. Uh, all right. So so anything else that we should know about tires? Yes. We're getting close to winter tire season, and you need to look at the area you're in and decide whether, you know, you need to get winter tires. And if so, the time to buy them is coming up in the next few months. So if you live uh, up above a certain elevation or you live where you get snow. If you live where you get snow, if your winter recreation stuff, skiing, snowmobiling, whatever, requires you to go in the snow fairly often. Um, if you have a job where you have to get to work every day, no matter what the weather is, you want to consider winter tires. Oh, all right. Do oh. minivans 
need winter tires? Minivans need tires run, that were bought more than eight, eight years ago. I run winter tires on my minivan. Okay, that's good to know. See, not not everybody has a horrible experience with a minivan. John doesn't. My minivan's awesome. No comment. <laughs> Megan, when I first met Megan, I asked her, was she interested in, in buying a new vehicle? She says, yes, I want to drive my minivan off a cliff. <laughs> so, or set it on fire, either yeah. way. Although I do run my minivan on high-performance tires, lowered on bigger wheels. Oh. That is quite different than what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to reconsider doing that. I'm going to copy that. All right. Uh, John Vincent from U- U.S. News and World Report. Thank you for helping us buy tires. Presumably you rank them at U.S. News? We do. All right. You can always go to the website and find those out. Uh, more auto, our auto expert coming up. Now you know how to shop for winter tires. So don't hang around. Go buy some. Megan, just buy some tires that aren't bald. Is that all right? Can you do that? I always get new tires. Yeah. I've got, I swear, my minivan goes through tires a lot. You wouldn't believe. My minivan is hard. Yeah, what's that about? I'm not, right, stop, 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 stop. Okay. I'm not getting into it. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. You can find all previous episodes of the show at OurAutoExpert.com. Uh, the show you're listening to is going to live there eventually. Uh, you can also uh, see some of our automotive videos and read inside car stories all online at OurAutoExpert.com. Plus, of course, you can get a good a lathering of all of our social media stuff, which uh, Jen and Megan, who are in the studio with us here, uh, are are forging as we speak. They're taking pictures of me and, and posting them. Uh, I I have a one of the things I have with my family is you always want your family to be safe. And even though uh, there are a lot of safe car companies out there, the one company that sort of sticks on the top of the pile is always Volvo as one of the safest car companies. But they're branching out from the performance and the safety and the the very clean Scandinavian designs to doing uh, a lot more with making it easier to own a Volvo. They introduced a program a little while ago called Care by Volvo which actually uh, is expanding almost on a uh, monthly basis to include different things. Joining us on the phone, Russell Datz from Volvo. Russell, Care by Volvo, how would you sum that up to somebody that's never come across it? Hi, Nick. How you doing? Yeah, Care by Volvo is Volvo's exclusive subscription service. You can actually subscribe to a car right online. So similar to you with a cell phone? Similar to a cell phone, just click subscribe and drive, and it's a it's a two year program for a flat monthly rate that in, actually includes insurance, just about all other expenses too, except gas. And after twelve months, you can actually upgrade to a new car, which is great. And that this was sort of the beginning uh, for you, but you keep adding things on to this, which each time I see the sort of things you're adding on, actually make my mouth drop. Uh, one of the things that uh, you taught us when I was on the recent trip to Banff in Canada with you to test drive some of your new vehicles was this new portion of uh, Volvo services, which includes the fact that you will do now, adding to that, is tow, tow for life. And, and is this right? I only, it doesn't matter what Volvo I buy, you'll cover it? We will, yeah. We're trying to create a real ecosystem of customer service to make people's lives easier no matter what Volvo you have and we also know that uh, you know once you buy a car the experience of owning it shouldn't end at the at the dealership uh, so tow for life along with accident advisor and lifetime parts warranty creates this real nice safety net that makes sure that you're covered even after you buy the car so for example if you have a problem with the vehicle uh, any vehicle it will be towed to a Volvo retailer within 25 miles for free uh, as long as you get the work done there. And any parts that are used on the car, as long as they're genuine Volvo parts and installed by a technician there at the retailer, is covered for life. What? So if, the, if that part again, uh, if that part breaks again, it's warranty. What if you're outside the 25 miles? Uh, each individual retailer can work out a special program or a special price with each customer. 
I mean, I, I like this idea because also once you have something fixed, if it goes bad again, you know, how many people have stories of they've gone to a dealer to get something fixed, and at this point, you know, you, there is absolutely no reason not to go to a Volvo dealership. Well, that's exactly right. And from from a business standpoint, that's exactly what it's intended to do. From a customer standpoint, it's supposed to drive uh, peace of mind. So, uh, you know, people now are keeping their cars on average, what, 11 years, I think it's up to right now. Right. So if you if you have a car that's, uh, you know, older than the four-year warranty or maybe it's even beyond the seven-year uh, certified program that we also offer, then uh, – well, actually, it's five years now. Sorry. We just changed that, too. Um, then you're covered as well. So you, there's a lot of reasons to go into the retailer versus going to an independent shop where you won't get that kind of security. Now, the other thing that you introduced, which to me is a, it sort of floors me too, is you know, or Volvo know many times, uh, many car companies do, when airbags deploy, when accidents happen, when these things happen, uh, you, you, get a, you can get a signal through the communications uh, system in the vehicle. And, and you guys can step in as well. And, and once you've made sure everybody in the vehicle is safe, you can actually intervene and help with the post-accident uh, amount of stuff that needs to be done. Yep. Uh, anytime any, anyone is in an accident, it's pretty stressful. And it's very difficult to keep your bearings, even after a minor one. Uh, think about how many times maybe somebody backs into you at a light or, you know, they're not paying attention and they just kind of roll into you or a parking lot, for example. It's, it's stressful. You're not sure what happened. It takes you by surprise. Uh, so what we wanted to do was make sure that you had everything at your fingertips to make sure that you collect the proper information and get what's needed so that your insurance company can get what they need to make sure that you're covered properly. And so how, how does the system a, it's work? An app. It's a, yeah, so it's an app on the phone. And what we do is we uh, once we see that you've been in an accident, uh, we will call the car through on-call, check that you're okay, if you're okay, and the airport, uh, even if the airbag has deployed, uh, you are you have this accident advisor to give you some kind of uh, guidepost uh, to keep yourself focused so you don't walk away and later saying, oh, my goodness, I forgot to get this bit of information or the insurance company says, you know, what's the, uh, uh, what's the other person's driver's license number? And you say, oh, well, I didn't get it. And they say, well, you know, we can't help you then. Kind right. of thing. So it, it just makes sure to keep you on, on task, as it were, at a time that's very, very stressful and distracting. Is there anything left for you to do? I mean, you seem to have repairs, accidents, and uh, a new car, insurance, uh, everything except for gas basically covered in your Volvo, right? Yeah, uh, we have a lot more. Uh, and w one of the things, too, that's not uh, we don't talk about much is because it's on the back end, is a new way uh, for roadside assistance calls where you can actually see where your tow truck is. So we did some research, and we found that also, when, you're, when your car might have a problem, uh, you know, waiting for that tow truck can be really stressful as well because you don't know where it is. You don't know how far away it is. If you're in a bad neighborhood or it's late at night somewhere rural, you know, who knows what's going to happen when. Now, just like you see on, for example, Uber, you can see how far away your car is. We do that with our roadside assistance tow trucks. And, and and this is sort of on top of all the stuff we haven't even had a chance to talk about yet, which is like uh, the idea of helping you get your car serviced as well. So saving you some time, saving you some stress and anxiety of just the regular car maintenance. If you own a Volvo, that, that's another service that Volvo allows you to partake in. It does, yeah. And, and we're all about trying to make life less complicated for people. We've got enough going on. Time is the only uh, and only thing we can't give back, you can't get it back, right? Your money you can get back, uh, things you can get back, but once time is gone, uh, that's it. So we're, we're trying to approach vehicle ownership. Uh, we call it freedom to move, right, in a, in a, a safe, sustainable, a personal, safe, sustainable way. Uh, so what do you do with your car when it's uh, not being used? So how do we take a uh, – and that's exactly what the Care by Volvo program is, right? Uh, when we, as a car company, uh, we have the great, as employees here, we get the great benefit of being able to have a car. Uh, and it's very easy for us to get one and own one. And we said, why don't we just expand that experience to the customer? So that's exactly what Care by Volvo is supposed to do and all these other things that are 
trying to make things easier for people when they own a Volvo. Now, you've seen a big uptake in people using these systems. Uh, you, even, you, obviously, many people, when you offer them, don't always uptake and use the systems. But are you seeing Volvo customers actually taking advantage of what you're offering? We do. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they are very excited about uh, these added benefits, the value add uh, when buying a Volvo. And it's especially helpful, too, once they learn of it, from our retail network that it's not offered by any other manufacturer. All right. How do we find out more about Care by Volvo? So the best thing to do is to go to our website, volvocars.com slash US, or just volvocars.com. And in there, uh, Care by Volvo should be right on top. Uh, the other way to do it, too, is to just Google Care by Volvo, and it'll take you right to the Care by Volvo page. All right, Russell, I'm actually very excited about this because uh, I like the idea of owning a Volvo and having it towed for life, especially. You I already know, picked mine for... out. You have? Colors, interior, this is amazing. All right, just send a note to Russell. He'll he'll get it for you. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Russell. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Care by Volvo, available through Volvo Cars. It's a really cool way of, uh, I think, owning a vehicle. Still to come on the show, we're going to talk about how to buy tires. We're also going to find out about... Uh, what to do if you get a nick inside of your wheel. A nick, get it? All right, that's all coming up on Our Auto Expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. Welcome back to Our Auto Expert. Find us online at ourautoexpert.com. All right, Anton Warman joining us again this week to talk about specifically uh, Rivian and electric trucks. So it looks like this is a company that is not backing down. They they had a product. They seem to be buying a factory. They're making the product. Is the Rivian dream a reality, or uh, are there still bumps in the road for them? Well, I think at this point we have to assume that it's very much real because what we suspected back in the early spring when Amazon invested a rumored $440 million dollars it was basically a $700 million round of which uh, uh, Amazon contributed supposedly $440 million. Everybody asked at the time, why do this precisely? And a lot of people speculated about uh, the possibility that they would be ordering uh, all-electric delivery vans from Rivian. And now we know it was true. Those uh, rumors, premonitions, theories, whatever you want to call them, the people who said that at the time, they were indeed right because Jeff Bezos here just recently announced that they are ordering 100,000 of these delivery vans to be delivered by the year 2030, starting in small scale at the very end of 2021 and with the volume deliveries starting already in 2022. Now, are Rivian going to be ready for that? Well, that's the big question. You'd have to believe that uh, they wouldn't make this announcement this way and having all of their insights as a major shareholder now without being able to um, to deliver on that. I mean, you could assume that you may only see maybe 100 or so units in 2021 and then up to as many as 10,000 of them rolling off the line in 2022. Keep in mind that as a delivery van, their testing and verification standards may not have to be as um, comprehensive and drawn out in terms of the calendar as they would be had this been a regular passenger car that uh, mere mortals have to drive and uh, and uh, therefore the associated liabilities that go along with that. There's many questions. Does the passenger truck, the SUV, uh, the truck version, does that still maintain its course of productivity and uh, and delivery? I think this strengthens the case for the truck and the SUV to become successful because if you think about it, this establishes a bit of a baseline in terms of both the financial, uh, how should I put it, the financial uh, baseline really for the company being able to order parts and get a sustaining form of business. And of course, it adds credibility that Amazon is not only an investor, but also a customer. I think this really enables the company to present itself to the vendors of all of the suppliers 
uh, in, ter- in terms of being a far more credible company that's actually going to be around it's going to be around for many many years if not decades and not be a some sort of a flash in the pan that'll peter out and go bankrupt in a couple of years now before we have about two minutes left but what does jeff bezos bring to the party apart from money and and being a customer he doesn't really bring much manufacturing manufacturing experience does he because he is basically a big warehouse company well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? He doesn't need to bring anything more to the part than being, oh, by the way, the world's richest man running what is sort of, depending on your definition, becoming the largest company in the world, uh, having invested in the company and having a need for many of these delivery trucks to be deployed around the world, starting just in the United States alone. So I think that this is um, that's really all that needs to happen here at this point. And, and really, the, one of the biggest problems that all of these EV startups have faced is, 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 is lack of access to capital and credibility and a firm start with an anchor customer. Amazon being an anchor customer and being an anchor investor. And oh, but put in about $500 million. So between all of those things, you have to assume at this point that Rivian is quite simply by a wide margin the most credible of all of these brand new EV players that are entering the market in the next uh, couple of years. It does It does seem like they are credible and the trucks and the SUV look uh, pretty nice as well. So they've done a good job with that and lots of thought has gone into it. When we return, let's talk a little bit about Ford and Rivian and let's talk about the uh, the truck itself and how that uh, Rivian can produce them for Amazon and make a profit at the same time, which seems like that might be uh, super difficult. If you're listening to us now, you can listen to previous episodes of the show at our autoexpert.com if you go to the website you'll also find uh, the videos from morning television of all the vehicles that we've had a chance to review you'll see those plus you can hear of course the podcast of the previous radio shows for the last several years and if you delve into it you can also read articles on the latest vehicles some of those articles coming to you from auto shows around the world and seeing some of the new cars and concept vehicles that the that have come to uh, auto shows like Frankfurt and the ones that will be coming up from the LA Auto Show. So those things will all be found at OurAutoExpert.com. Plus, you can find an in-depth look at the news by uh, surfing our social media channels. You'll find them on Instagram, you'll find them on Facebook and on Twitter, where we keep you up to date with all the latest news. And of course, OurAutoExpert.com. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. Still with us, Anton Wallman, our independent investor and analyst. We're talking about Rivian, the electric vehicle company that is uh, has a factory in Normal, Illinois. Uh, Ford had somewhat of a dance with Rivian. Is that dance still continuing? It appears so. I mean, they struck this deal after Amazon put in their part of the money earlier in the spring than Ford did. So clearly Ford, when making this investment, must have known what was underway. So you have to believe that this latest move by Amazon to order 100,000 delivery vans was not a surprise to them and that it played some part in Ford making the investment in Rivian. So they have announced already at that time that uh, they're going to jointly make some sort of a new vehicle. They didn't say which type, but one that would be branded Ford, and they didn't say where it was going to be manufactured. So I think that those plans, we have to assume at this point, are unchanged and unaffected by what was announced here most recently by Amazon in their capacity as a large-scale customer for Rivian. But Ford have also said that they'll continue the down the path of making their very own electric F-150. Correct. The Ford F-150 version that is all electric, not a hybrid, but just pure electric, was already relatively deep into development. And what we mean by deep into development means at least in the ballpark of about two years when this whole thing uh, transpired here in the spring of 2019. So, uh, And they also subsequently showed here, I think it was maybe, was it early August or something like that, Ford showed uh, a towing exercise in which a development prototype 
of the F-150 towed a bunch of railway railway cars that weighed uh, something like a million tons or whatever it was. I mean, it was a fantastically large number, which, of course, given the low rolling resistance and the uh, overall constraints of the test doesn't really mean all that much, but it was a cool test to show. And uh, they are definitely on it. And I think... Uh, all the indications are, and Ford has basically confirmed that the all-electric F-150 will be in the market before the end of 2021. That may be December 21, 2021, but nevertheless, before the end of 2021, that's when they've said this truck is coming to market. Now, of course, Ford also uh, will be bringing their... I think it's lovingly called the Mach 1 or the Model X, uh, their version of the electric SUV to the LA Auto Show. So they're quite deep into electric vehicle development. Yes, they are. That vehicle has been development now for multiple years, and uh, they are only a couple of short months away from uh, unveiling it. And uh, the, uh, if, if all of the information that we have had for quite some time now is correct, it's supposed to go into production in Ford's major factory in Mexico in April of 2020, and uh, therefore realistically be on sale in the U.S. possibly as early as July of 2020. So for Ford to unveil this vehicle at the L.A. Auto Show, uh, I don't know for a fact whether they will do that or not, but it certainly would seem to make sense. The timeline makes all the sense in the world, so I certainly wouldn't bet against that. Uh, one of the things that was interesting at the announcement of Ford's Corsair, which happened at the uh, LA, sorry, at the New York Auto Show this year, and it's just been available for ride and drives with the, the journalists, was uh, when they announced the Aviator, there was a GT, a plug-in hybrid version that had 400 horsepower. When they announced the Corsair, there was a lack of a GT version, a plug-in hybrid version of this vehicle, and so the 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 pretty much certain rumor is that we'll get to see that at LA too, but uh, will it be more electrified than the GT version of the Aviator, you think? Well, I think the powertrain pollinations between these unibody SUVs between Ford and Lincoln here that are coming out now in a fast-paced manner, two and three rows once alike, the longitudinal engine uh, ones, the larger ones alike, as well as the transverse ones, the smaller ones like the Ford Escape alike, all of them uh, should basically be seeing the same powertrains between the Lincoln and the Ford version. So there's some staggering going on with respect to the announcements of them. For example, on the larger one, the uh, Ford Explorer, it is going on sale at the end of this year in Europe as a plug-in hybrid. Now, as you know, in the beginning here, there is no plug-in hybrid version available of the Ford Explorer. There's only a plug-in hybrid version of the Lincoln version, the Aviator, Aviator available in the U.S. So there, I think they're just staggering the introductions of these by a few months, maybe up to a year, just to try a little bit different here, a little bit different there, depending on some market and geographical requirements and, and so forth. So I don't, I don't think that it really means much in the end. I think they all, all of those roads all end up in Rome, which is to say, all variants will become available on uh, in both under both brands. Just takes a little amount of time now. Obviously, Ford deep into the electrification of their brand. General Motors, we know, deep into the electric electrification of their brand. They have the Bolt. They have a new Bolt version coming out. Uh, they're rumored to de be developing several more electrified uh, platforms over the next year. But there seems to be a, a notable absence from of the Fiat Chrysler automobile group of anything electric. Have they completely abandoned? in their plans or are they still top secret no i mean i think in a, when it comes to the all electric stuff the only brand that had announced something that they were going to do it until here recently was maserati and i think uh basically the other brands have really focused on coming out with plug-in hybrids i mean here in the u.s i think the one that will shock most people is going to be the uh, Jeep Wrangler, which is going to come out also here in the very first quarter of 2020. I mean, think about it. We're only a very small number of months away from this, and I don't know when they will show us this and show us the specs of the 
uh, plug-in hybrid Jeep Wrangler, but I have to believe it's pretty soon because the production is starting in January. Uh, and then they've already shown the details of the Jeep Compass and the Jeep Renegade plug-in hybrid versions, and they're moving the Compass uh, production also to Italy for the first time, uh, having previously made it in in Mexico and other places. So um, clearly attacking and defending and being able to be relevant in the European market uh, is going to uh, uh, ena- it's going to en- enable Jeep to do that with these new models. And of course, the Wrangler will be a bit of a one of a kind for the U.S. market here in 2020. So they do have some of these things that are interesting. They had a recent announcement from Maserati, which was extremely confusing. And it was extremely confusing as to how it differed from their previous outline of their roadmap that they did in early June of 2018, the sort of the last uh, public appearance of some sort of Sergio Marchioni when they explained what they had in mind for Maserati. It was actually Tim Kaniskis, who was head of the brand at that time, but is no longer, who made that presentation. And uh, it was bewildering as it was back in June of 2018. And now they come out here in uh, in about uh, September of 2019 and come with another somewhat bewildering and confusing an announcement as to what is going to happen with Maserati's electrification. And it's clear that it's mostly, but not exclusively, but mostly also plug-in hybrids. So Maserati also uh, um, taking everything back to Italy, um, which is, of course, where they were originally from. And uh, they're housing the brand much more solidly back in Italy when they had a headquarters in uh, in what in De- Michigan uh, at the uh, pre- basically the FCA headquarters. But they recently announced that they were going to be concentrating back on their roots in Italy. Yeah, the problem is in terms of concentrating on their roads, ask yourself the question, why do people buy a Maserati? Um, you know, what do they what kind of product do they want? Do they want a, an electrified product, something electric, or do they want the roar of of essentially a Ferrari type V8 in a more elegant practical uh type uh, body? Um I mean is the, I mean I have to I have a hard time uh, believing that the traditional Maserati buyer is going to have a huge appetite for anything electrified. I mean, uh, it may be necessary to do this for various legal reasons, but uh, I mean, this is this is not, I think, uh, why people have been buying the Maserati brand. I think that's going to be a pretty tough uphill battle for it. I feel. Say that again, Megan. Do you think that it will attract new buyers to their brand? Yeah, maybe it'll invigorate the brand to to find new audiences. Well, clearly that would be the hope. I mean, that's the only hope that they will take at least as many buyers, new, bring them new to the brand, then they're going to lose from the brand from those who had no interest in any of this stuff. But, I mean, that's why I'm saying that this gamble is a, is a very dangerous one because it's not all that clear that of all the brands that are going to have very attractive electrified offerings over the next five or so years that maserati is going to be able to come up with a product that's so much better than porsche and you know so many of these other brands that they are going to be the ones that will be successful in that transition so i think that there's a lot of peril ahead for Maserati in that transition. Oh, no, I can picture all those people that love the environment, but they always wanted to own a Maserati. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other thing yeah, is, too... There, there, are, there are, I think that there are approximately three of those people <laughs> inside the 50 United States, maybe. <laughs> that, the, the kind of the, that Venn diagram is <laughs> super paper thin. The uh, you know the only thing that I that strikes me as interesting is the Quattroporte from Maserati looks very similar to the Tesla Model S. I mean they're about the same size, they're they're about the same market uh, uh, purchaser. So uh, apart from that, uh, I wonder if they think they're going to take some of the Tesla Model S market away by electrifying something like the Quattroporte. Well, the Maserati Quattroporte has only one simple cultural identification, and that is. Miami Vice, 1986, drug dealer from Colombia. So basically, when it comes to the Maserati or Quattroporte, you know, trying to reinvent what is the long-standing public view of your brand and brand identity to something that is so diametrically opposed to where it has been for about 30 plus years already, that's a one of the most difficult tasks you can ever imagine. And I, I rarely bet in favor of success in such uh, attempts at uh, market identification and shifts.
Yeah, I'm not, I agree with you there. It doesn't seem like it's an obvious uh, thought pattern. Uh, final question as we run out of time. Uh, let's jump back to Rivian quickly. Uh, do we think that, uh, you know, Rivian is going to uh, make a loss on every vehicle they sell to Amazon? Or uh, are they going to eke out a profit? Because this is a company that's already made a huge loss with uh, just R&D. Yeah, I mean, this is the trickiest question. It's really one of transfer pricing. So Amazon is a minority shareholder of Rivian, but they'll be buying 100% of these trucks. So basically, do they try to make more money in their capacity as a shareholder or or in their capacity as a customer? Traditional economics would tend to suggest that they would want to favor themselves in their role as a customer, thereby pricing the product too low, meaning that Rivian would essentially break even or lose many things. On the other hand, if Amazon could make money in their capacity as their shareholder by increasing the value of the company disproportionately and have some sort of strange idea of monetizing that later, that would tend to uh, suggest that they would be willing to allow uh, Rivian to make more money on it uh, I think that this is almost impossible to tell at this stage, but I think it's under any circumstance good for Rivian because it, that this gets this gets them a baseline volume, a baseline volume upon which they can then sell all of their other recreational products like the SUV and the pickup truck to people who are definitely going to, I think, be willing to pay more than what Amazon is going to be willing to pay for a bunch of delivery trucks. Right. All right. Uh, finally, tell us where we can read your stuff, Anton. Primarily at SeekingAlpha.com and secondarily at TheStreet.com. And our woman, our independent in- analyst and investor with his crystal ball of what's going to happen to electrification, the Rivian, to Amazon and all those things. And our crystal ball is much more certain. You could listen to previous predictions at OurAutoExpert.com by clicking on podcast. You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at ourautoexpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response.